Aloha and welcome to the Galactic Council of Light 2024 Energy Forecast. I'm Taylor Norris, Certified Quantum Soul Guidance Practitioner and Galactic Astrology Soul Reader. And today I am honored and thankful and grateful and blessed to be joined by fellow Certified Practitioners, Renee. Hello, Renee. Ulrika, Josh, Louise, Tina, Joyce, and our amazing teacher, Julia. Thank you all so much for being here and sharing your wisdom about the exciting energies of 2024. And thank you to all of you who are listening and watching and resonating. We appreciate your presence, your receptivity, and your openness. The intention of this video is to provide you with valuable healing, empowerment, guidance, and inspiration to our community and soul family of galactically curious, awakening souls. I have been guided to initiate this collaboration at the persistent nudging of my guides, those who call themselves the Galactic Council of Light, and they have informed me of the human component of this council, which includes all of us here gathered together live, as well as those of you listening, watching, and resonating. I waited and I waited to call together this council and ask my guides to give me one final sign that I should go for it. I live in Hawaii and so I was driving down to the coast for my daily walk and I was greeted by this enormous, beautiful, clear rainbow. And this rainbow did not come and go. It stayed there and it morphed and it changed, but it stayed there for over an hour on my walk. And I knew in my heart and every fiber of my being that this was the sign and to initiate this gathering and that this rainbow frequency and energy is core to what will be transmitted today. I was reinformed this morning that an energy transmission will also be part of this video, bringing in unity, wholeness, balance, thriving, prosperity, and many higher frequencies that we're very hungry for and ready for at this time. So I'll take a moment now and invite us to go ahead and close our eyes and take some deep breaths together as we close our circle, creating a sacred space, inviting in the highest possible expression of this video, of this gathering, the circle of the Galactic Council of Light, that we may be clear channels open to receiving divine guidance, enlightened wisdom for the highest and greatest benefit. Of all who this time blessing in 2024 and beyond we invite in and receive wholeness unity balance thriving wellness and prosperity for all aho amen namaste and so it is mahalo All right, and so now we will begin the wisdom sharing. Renee, please take it away. 
Okay. Hello, everybody. And Taylor, thank you for this idea and opening this up. And, you know, you just changed my my talk. And so that's awesome. <laughs> and um, I'm going to show some, some slides um, with you right now that I just put together. What I'm called to talk about Pluto into Aquarius we know that that's a big transit that's coming up on January 20th, 2024. And Pluto um, is going to be, you know, has been and will continue to be on my ascendant, which is zero degrees Aquarius. And so the stars I'm going to be talking about that are part of this conjunction when Pluto and Aquarius are stars that I have um, in my chart on my ascendant. So, um, I'm just offering this little brief presentation here, but I'll be doing larger, more um, presentations throughout January specifically and throughout the year to help people adjust to, okay, what is this new transformational energy with Pluto in Aquarius? So actually Pluto will already be conjunct the two stars, Alberio and Altar, when he enters Aquarius. Because once he hits Capricorn 2926 on January 3rd, he will be conjunct Altar, which has a large orb of 2.4, 2.40, which is, which is really quite large for a star. The other star is more subtle, so we'll be able to feel the energy of the conjunction while Pluto is still in the transformational feeling of Capricorn, which is very earthy and very masterly. It's like this earth mastery sign. And so many of us have been trying to put together what we know to bring into this, this transition, uh, this transformational energy that Pluto brings to each sign. So Pluto will be bringing transformational energy into the sign of Aquarius, which he hasn't been in for like 240 years. So this is new for, for us on this planet. So the stars are going to help us adjust to the new, faster air energy of transformation that Pluto is bringing into the sign of Aquarius. So being able to connect with these two stars, I feel, is going to help us be able to adjust to these new energies. So astrologers like to look at exact conjunctions. So I put those exact dates here. And this is this is all um, of it will be available to all of my email subscribers and YouTube subscribers and and you'll be able to, at the end, know what all of that is. But one of the things that is happening is Pluto is going to station to go retrograde just before he hits an exact conjunction with Altar, which is huge because when a big planet like Pluto stations to go retrograde, there is this, this feeling that he stops still and stations for a couple of days where he's not moving at all. And the energy is much easier to connect to on those days when a large planet stations. Let me let me skip to the next slide where it's a little clearer and you can see it in the chart. Um, this is this is what is going to be happening as Pluto hits zero degrees, zero degrees. What is beneficial to all of us trying to key in with this new transformational energy is the sun ushers Pluto in. So when you have the sun ushering in a new planet as it enters a new sign, it makes it easier for us to connect with the energy, especially since most of us are used to connecting with stars through the sun. Like tracking, oh, okay, the sun is on this star, so I'm going to connect with it on this day when the sun is exact to that star. And so the sun will be there helping us with the illumination energies of both Alberio and Altar. So the sun will be conjunct 
both of those when it goes into Aquarius and bringing Pluto with it so that we can see the illumination of the sun with the energy from these stars coming through to us and the Pluto, which is this, this new, entering this new way of, of being transformational. So Altera is currently at 2.06 degrees. And interestingly enough, when Pluto enters Aquarius, that's the degree of Altar because Altar is in retrograde um, at the moment Pluto enters, which is helpful to us because when a star or a cosmic point is in retrograde, we can reflect more easily on it. And then by the time the star or the galactic point goes direct, we can take action from the downloads that we received from that star. So another interesting thing is that Venus is conjunct the galactic center at the moment that Pluto enters Aquarius which is very helpful if we have a connection to the galactic center that helps us connect to this energy. Venus um, being right on it can help us bring in the divine feminine aspect. Haimea is the, the higher octave of Neptune, which is the higher octave of Venus, and it is going to be on the Shapley attractor this Haimea is a trans-Neptunian planet. It's beyond Neptune. It stays in signs for a long time. So Haimea has been here on Shapley for quite a while and it's going to continue to be affected by, by this energy, this beautiful, this, this cosmic point of energy that is like a gravitational pull and an attraction. Um, also, some more divine feminine energy as Pluto enters Aquarius is that Saturn and this trans-Neptunian planet Gong Gong are both going to be on the star Fomal Heart, and Fomal Heart energies is related to Archangel Gabriel, which in this in the stories in Christianity, the great mother energy is Mother Mary and Archangel Gabriel coming to tell Mary the news that she's going to be giving birth to a special child that can bring in the Christ light for all of us to use. So Saturn is conjunct this star and Gong Gong, which is this empathic wizard energy is also in the mix. Um, it, he's been on Fulma Heart for the last few months and it's gonna continue very few more months. So all of these energies are set up to help us in this transition between these energies. This is what this star looks like too. Um, it's a golden star with a twin star, this little blue star. And so when you have twin stars working together, there's a different energy than when you're just working with one star. These stars are in relationship, um, working together. And it is in the constellation of Cygnus, which is the swan, and um, this star, Alberio, is on the beak. There is a lot of great mother energy in this star, Alberio, according to Divine Harmony. So I checked in and dis discovered my own connection to the Divine Feminine, which, not surprising, um, for me is Mother Mary, who pointed me not just to what I know about her, but pointed me to this, this more universal sense of the great, the great mother that all of these embodiments of this great mother energy um, are receiving and working with. So we've got the, the divine great mother energy coming through, not only um, Mat, which is divine harmony, led us to, but also um, Mother Mary, and so in many different expressions. So we can just take our personal expression of, um, connection to this energy and find them, find the more universal divine source. Um, so Albiero is a very gentle star, and it can help us as we're adjusting, um, as Pluto, you know, learns how to be in a new a new sign. And then the next star is Altar, which 
more people write about. And for me, having this on my ascendant, this is Altar right here, very close to here. So it's got Altar, and this is like the head of the eagle. So we've got swans and eagles. So what this is telling me is that we're all ready to soar. And all of these stars, when we connect, if we connect to Altar, we can uh, we can connect and move from star to star in a constellation pattern through the rainbow. And since um, um, Taylor brought up the whole rainbow idea, it's like there's this whole energy of the rainbow moving us from star to star in a constellation. So that can help us get a get a larger embodiment and feel of of what this star is inviting us into and for me the way that this star works for me is that when i connect to it um i connect to it in my left hip i connect to it in the in my calf too that has helped me in my life and it helps me step forward into the unknown with courage so this this star can help us as pluto is teaching us a new way of transformation, this star can help us bring courage and to be able to speak what, what is unknown, because what we're going to be stepping into is the unknown types of energies from, from Pluto. We're just finishing up our work now, at the end of the work, the work that we were doing in Capricorn, which is go of and we are stepping into the ability, we are stepping out of our Capricorn cage that we've been dismantling and the, the courage to come into the new, but come in with steps of gentleness um, with these two stars as our helpers as we move through and help others through because, we, because we're all leaders here and we're stepping through and we can find these energies that are going to be helpful to everybody as as we all move through this this coming year of 2024. So thank you, everyone. I will go ahead and stop sharing now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renee. Ulrika, please share. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to share three slides. So I would like to continue the uh, important points that Renee brought up with some focus around three different dates in 2024 and some really important conjunctions and constellation fixed stars that are highlighted at that time. And um, this first slide is really highlighting uh, um, two areas of the chart of uh, February 13. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that we have an interaction here over the course of the first five months between the North Node, Mars, and Chiron. And I just uh, have these three slides will we'll, uh, take you through a little uh, story or, you know, continuum between these uh, three very important points in our charts, but also highlight the fixed stars that are associated because they're repetitive. And that mean, always means something when repetitive areas of the charts are highlighted. So in this first point here, um, I want to make is, of course, as Renee mentioned, Pluto is going to go into Aquarius uh, in January. And this first point uh, around February 13th is when Mars is conjunct Pluto. Because Mars is often coming in and highlighting something uh, that is either uh, some sort of action is taken. It's uh, personal planets for many. It's going to also activate their charts in different ways. So as Renee said, Pluto at the time is conjunct Aquila Altair, uh, but also Lyra Aladfar. And this combination, they're very close in proximity to each other in the sky, but it definitely highlights this part of our energy that is really associated with liberation from injustice. So Mars coming in here, highlighting this, is going to activate us in terms of, okay, what do I need to release here in this new environment, Pluto in Aquarius? 
So this, this to me, is an important time. Now, in addition, on this day, and I've just cast a chart here for noon um, in Boston, Massachusetts, where I'm located, but as, as it so happens, there is another point that is activated very significantly here, and that's the North Node. The true position of the North Node is exactly conjunct Chiron on this day, and as I cast it, sh this chart, the Moon is there as well. So this combination of energies and i want to highlight the fixed star alparats and also tau ceti cirrus tau ceti in this construct here at 16 degrees of aries because tau ceti is going to come back as a story um, over the course of this year and tau ceti is associated with energy around diplomacy uh, sometimes it's actually more of a highlighting energy I feel like a spotlight is coming on us at this time from uh, the fixed art Tau Ceti. So it, it will hi highlight some sort of diplomacy or uh, some due diligence here. And in combination with Chiron, it's likely with, uh, you know, our, our wounds in some shape or form that we either need to heal or turn into uh, a gift, right, and teach others about it. So here we have uh, also a sense of freedom in this area at 16 degrees of, of Aries. Um, and also that we enjoy those gifts that we have now either healed through our Chiron journey or uh, we're ready to share. So I think the interpretation of these two energies at this on this day can be, you know, mark your calendars <laughs> for February 13th. Now, there's a continuum of energy here. So I want to take us to the next chart, which is the solar eclipse on April 8th. And there's a link here, as you will find. Now, if you paid attention to Mars in the previous chart, Mars is now on this solar eclipse conjunct Saturn or in the vicinity of Saturn in Pisces there. So there has been a journey between Mars traveling from Pluto up to Saturn. But also on the solar eclipse, we have a conjunction between the solar eclipse here at 19 degrees of Aries with Chiron. So <laughs> what does this mean? And Tau Ceti is again highlighted at the solar eclipse. Very interesting, right? So we are continuing this, you know, due diligence, if you will, or this need for making um, something right or balancing an energy here. And the solar eclipse is going to be super important for that. Now, uh, I also am very fond of finding patterns, and, and we do have a kite in this chart highlighting uh, the supergalactic center. And if you uh, see here, Venus position at 27 degrees of Aries is very much opposite. Uh, within the wide orb we, we work with is in opposition to the supergalactic center. We also have this minor grand trine building from the Pleiades with Sedna at zero degrees of uh, Gemini. And also, of course, Pluto is engaged here. So what does this mean? This kite at the solar eclipse is an energy of infusion of feminine, divine feminine energy. And Mars here talking to Saturn, uh, squaring Orion Betelgeuse. It, there is a conversation of what needs to take place here because Tau Ceti is highlighted again. It is that how can we be more supportive? How can we be more in doing our own due diligence, stepping into our, our talents and gifts at this time? And the solar eclipse is going to shine a very bright light with with guidance from Pleiades and Sedna there, uh, but also Pluto pointing at the um, supergalactic center. So Tau Ceti is clearly in the, in the focus here. And then we take another step and we can go on, but the, these are the three highlights that I pulled out from 2024. Now, again, pay attention to Mars here in this chart. This is from May 19th. And uh, Mars's journey has continued, right? And this, <laughs> on this date, Mars is conjunct the North Node. 
and we have more going on here but that that is really also a an activation of our future direction now andromeda alparats is highlighted at that time and alparats again associated with freedom liberation you know really enjoying our gifts and talents so this time of the year may be uh, some sort of download us haha now i know my new direction for the year it's taken a couple of months <laughs> but but the north node conjunct mars here is definitely an activation of some sort we have uh, more to come i'm just highlighting also the sun conjunct jupiter here around this date but also venus conjunct uranus the, there's a bigger story to those conjunctions that I'm not going to um, go into here in, in this video, but the fact that we are having these very important alignments uh, highlighting Andromeda Alparats in this chart, and also around you know the late degrees of Taurus here go going in and, and activating the Pleiades constellation or star cluster along with that Sedna position that we have had there for a long long time it's going to be an infusion again of awakening ascension energy that's how I interpret these three points and I want to just stop there because this story continues and we have a very important point in April as well that I know that I think it's Josh next that's going to talk about that. So yeah, enjoy these these journeys with us and uh, I'm so happy you're here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ulrika. Josh, go ahead. Yeah, it's great to be here. So yes, very, very exciting. Some astrologers are calling this the kind of astrological highlight of the year. And so on the 21st of April, 1.27 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time, uh, we have a conjunction at 21 degrees between Jupiter and Uranus, uh, Uranus in the uh, sign of Taurus. So we've got Jupiter's expansive brave, um, full of fortune and adventure kind of energies meeting with Uranus's uh, limitlessness and breakthrough and innovative and even kind of rebellious energy coming together in the sign of Taurus, which represents material pleasures and Mother Earth and the economic and financial um, kind of systems of the world. We've also got a conjunction to Pandora, which is one of the asteroids at this point. And she's known within Greek mythology as the first woman, kind of similar to, to Eve. And um, obviously, many of us know the story of Pandora with her box, um, where she opens it, she's given this box, opens it, uh, it spills out all the evils onto the world, but left within it is hope. And um, I'm just going to kind of like pinpoint all the kind of main astrological influences and then I'm going to explain more about what all of this means. So on a galactic level, we have uh, Hadar, uh, also known as Beta Centauri, in an opposition. And Hadar is uh, a very sheltered, um, heavenly star system full of peace and harmony. It's, uh, it's just a beautifully unconditionally loving, heavenly experience there. Uh, we've also got a trine to the Lyra Nebula and Sulafat. <clears throat> Sulafat is in the Lyra constellation too. It is it's the second brightest star within Lyra, uh, and it's known as the tortoise shell, uh, which kind of allows the sound of the Lyra to reverberate and bounce off and vibrate into the universe. So we've got all of these, <laughs> in this exact moment, energies working together. And to me, if I was to give this all a big kind of title, it would be Quantum Leap Your heaven on earth and what i sense with this is there is just this beautiful embodiment of heaven on earth that is uh, in in potential for all really it's it's a a moment where 
or a period of time because the energies are going to be, you know, really felt for quite a while, uh, I would have thought, either side of this date. But I, I really feel like the soul and the body are going to kind of become one, like the soul being heaven and, um, and the body being earth, just like having more potential to kind of come into oneness where this allows the kind of the divine plan of your soul to have a quantum leap expansion into what it's here to give and uh, and to serve with you know you could experience great expansions within finances in your businesses in the way that you serve you could have incredible innovative downloads during this time and you know Taurus being uh, ruled by Venus you have lots of creativity coming through so just being really heart-centered and, and open to inspiration and creativity and what the universe wants to do through you because you know, this is going to be specific to you and your chart as well. So I would have a look at any of the uh, the galactic alignments that I've mentioned and where they line up in your chart as to how this might affect your life and your personal quantum leap on, of the uh, heaven on earth may uh, manifest. Now, I think the things that are going to be most supportive uh, you know, with the energies of Hadar, it's just keep your love on. <laughs> so the more that you can expand into unconditional love on a very embodied level. So, you know, a lot of souls uh, who resonate with this kind of work may have had a lot of heavenly experiences and carry a lot of that frequency within their souls. And they come to Earth with, uh, you know, the, the cellular memory and the DNA of a very different kind of frequency. So the more that we can really unconditionally love our bodies, um, our ancestors, the collective consciousness and those around us, the more that we can find, you know, home of heaven here on earth because the new earth really starts with us <laughs> and it starts with our own embodiment of that so that we can then see the manifestation and the creation of it around us but i really think that this point is going to be oh, just an amazing opportunity for the age of Aquarius and the new earth to be ushered in. Um, another thing that I would really highly recommend is seeing the silver lining. So, you know, with Pandora here and all the challenges and the evils of the world that she kind of releases, you know, the more that we can look at these challenges with wisdom and see that there is a silver lining, there is enlightenment on the other side from any shadow, any challenge that we can experience, the more that we focus our vision on really seeing the other side, the more that we can really expand into that quantum leap that clearly wants to happen from that springboard of hope that's left within her box. So with the trine to Lyra and the Lyra Nebula, a lot of souls came into this galaxy from the Lyra Nebula into uh, the Lyra constellation and kind of created a bit of a heaven on earth uh, for themselves before a draconian influence came and invaded. And so there was a lot of trauma that was experienced. So I, I really think that during this time, there could be healing from a really ancient galactic experience that we've had, which allows a huge ripple effect of love to to kind of move throughout our whole galaxy to bring this galaxy into more unity oneness and love and with the influence of sulafat as well i think you know being the tortoise shell the more that we engage with our sound uh, the more that we engage with our voice we, the more we affirm uh, who we are and what we're creating and let that sound release into the universe, I think the more we'll kind of support the quantum leap of our own personal heaven on earth that wants to happen during this time to become manifest. I just want to note as well, I know Joyce is going to talk a little bit more about the numerology of the year, but it just really interests me that it's 21 degrees, 21st of April, which obviously adds up to three. And so the number three is about communication. So um, 
really important to to kind of communicate to the universe exactly what we what our hearts and our souls are desiring to manifest through this uh, incredible opportunity that the cosmos is giving us and um, it's also the number of creativity and magic and artistry so the more kind of creative and the more we can be in our own artistic expression the more the magic is going to just support this uh, incredible cosmic alignment for us to really experience more of this heaven on earth so yeah that's my bit <laughs> thank you for doing this taylor and thank you for letting me share big love <laughs> Thank you so much, Josh. Wow, so exciting. <laughs> Louise, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thank you so much. This is so amazing. And it's so, um, although we're all talking about something different, the synergy between it all um, as it's starting to sort of evolve and play out, I'm like, wow. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk about an aspect that is going to be active. Um, it sort of comes into play towards the end of April. Um, but it is going to be active for the majority of 2024 and throughout 2025 as well. So it kind of feels like um, it's like the supportive activity in it's sort of in behind the scenes, if you like. What it is, is what we're calling a galactic grand air trine. And I just want to um, shout out to Molly McCord because I do her annual astrology courses online and this is something that she sort of um drew attention to in the 2024 course so it's too good not to share i wanted to kind of try and sort of bring it to this audience so i mean obviously we're all we all know about the ascension process and there's a lot of talk about shifts in consciousness and great awakening and i feel that this grand air trine is really instrumental in supporting that process um, because for um, when you have an, a grand air trine, it means that there are three planets or points all lying within um, the same element. So um, we are going to have Pluto, which Renee or already spoke about, moving into Aquarius. And Pluto is going to be between zero and two degrees of Aquarius throughout the year, apart from a sort of a short um, return back into Capricorn. Um, but we also have Sedna, who is moving into Gemini um, at the end of April, 27th of April, I believe. And the third point in this trine is the supergalactic centre at two degrees of Libra. So because Pluto is going back and forward, um, it's going to be um, stay in this trine. Sedna doesn't move from zero, Gemini um in 2024 and obviously the super galactic center is a fixed point um, and when we have a trine in air and um, the themes that are stepping forward are very much about information um, it's a very mental energy but it also is very much about supporting our understanding and having new information coming through that um, sort of enhances our understanding and um, air is also for me all about energy and frequency and consciousness and with the trine being activated there's a beautiful flow between these three points and also it feels that once the kind of momentum gets going because of the trying, there's this continuous flow, it's going to be quite hard to stop. So whereas in the past we've been working with other elements, when it gets to air, you can't really contain air or, con or control it or curtail it. So, you know, it's because it is everywhere. So um, it does feel, um, I know a lot of us waiting for sort of information to start flowing and disclosure, but I'm, I kind of really feel with this particular aspect that once things start going, it's going to be like we have lift off. So just to pick apart these three planets and points very briefly, um, it's very rare for outer planets to change signs because they have such um, long and slow transit. So the fact that we've got Pluto and Sedna both moving into air you know, within a short space of time is a, it's a big deal. Um, all three planets and points are way out. So this is taking the energy way beyond our kind of day to day human experience, our reality, our understanding of, um, you know, of, of humanity. Um, and 
So taking us into a completely different um, experience and frame of reference. Now with Pluto in Aquarius and what we're looking at is Pluto is always about transformation and evolution. And um, so Pluto wants us to evolve. And in Aquarius, this is very much a humanity theme. It's about science. It's about technology. It's taking us out to the galactics, you know, which is great news for us and what we do. Um, but I also feel with the Aquarius energy, um, whereas in the past things might have happened that have been very compartmentalised, um, we're now moving into a time where what happens affects us all, you know, so it's a whole world experience rather than just, you know, something's happening in that part of the world. Oh, yeah, we know about it, but we don't need to get involved. I think this is going to bring constant experiences where, yeah, you can't turn a blind eye because it's affecting us all. This is about progress and there's a real sense of rebirth, renewal and deconstructing what we knew um, what we believed and um, so that we can move forward. And then we, when we go around to the next corner, we've got Sedna, um, very, very slow transit. Um, so she has been in um, Taurus since 1965, I believe. And Sedna really is about what is hidden within our deep subconscious, what is frozen in there. And that can be information that we're holding within our cellular framework, information that has been um, hidden from us. Um, concealed, blocked off. And it's also about Sedna had to let go of everything that she relied on and everything that she knew. She um, was tossed, tossed into the ocean and she regenerated because she had to adapt to this new environment. So it's about what happens when we are um, freed from dominance, from control, from the patriarchal system that we've been living under and how we adapt. And with the Gemini influences, it's all about information. It's about our mind, our mental um, understanding and our, our framework and our reference. And then we go round to the third corner um, of the triangle and the super galactic centre, which is um, a cosmic point that we use um, a lot in astrology. It's very powerful. It behaves like a black hole. So this is very much about um, sort of pulling away everything that is no longer true or um, that isn't resonant with where we're going in our evolution. And um, when the super galactic centre is active, we want to um we want to know more we want to be more we want we're being stretched out of our experience and our understanding and um it's it's we're on a journey of self discovery but it is taking us way out beyond into the cosmos um, and it kind of we have this great desire to connect with something outside of ourselves this point is also very alchemical it transmutes it's breaking down so we've got this kind of um real sort of rebirth, regeneration and transformation theme. And just to go back to Pluto, what's really interesting that Pluto is going to be squaring the Shapley attractor, which is another cosmic point um, at two degrees of Scorpio. So again, we've got um, beautiful, what, what squares can sometimes be quite challenging and quite tense, but because Pluto is very aligned with the Shapley attractor energy is scorpionic and um, it feels like rather than tension and challenge it's very catalytic and it's like you know both both um the Shapley attractor and Pluto want to get to the bottom of things it's about truth it's about exposing and it's about having full transparency so um I feel that again that's going to be ongoing this is not a short transit this is kind of really you know keeping the momentum going so with these, with this grand air trine, we've obviously got the flow. Um, it's all about consciousness, and it just—it's really fascinating to me that all three points are very much about rebirth, about regeneration. It's about a new understanding, and what we can expect to see is our, or receive is information about our evolution, about our history, about what is out there, sort of beyond our solar system how we fit into the bigger picture. There's likely to be lots of starseed awakenings, even more so than there have been till now. I mean, we talk a lot about DNA upgrades and um, activations. Again, that's part of it, this increase in consciousness, the raising of vibration, and um, really ultimately about the truth um, that we need 
to know about and learn about to kind of help us transform and evolve. So this is about um, soul growth as well. So um, very exciting time. So <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Louise. Wow, I'm getting really excited. <laughs> All right, Tina, please take it away. Share with us. Hello, everybody. So I wanted to talk about Venus' eight-year cycle and um, cosmic points and how that is going to look like in 2024 20, and forward and the moon's trining and sextiling in June 24 to the star point with Andromeda and Corvus conjuncting the nodes. So let us go briefly through the Venus cycle. Here I'm using the sor as source the work of Ariel Gutman, who has provided in her books and videos about Venus uh, star points. And the Venus is, of course, the planet of love and beauty and relationships and values. And um, uh, Venus has this eight-year cycle where she makes this beautiful choreography with sun. And Venus has this uh, retrograde period in every 19 and a half months or so. And last summer we had the Leo retrograde uh, period in August. And this five petal star is moving to clockwise direction and moves one to three degrees every time it comes to one of these petal, uh, these star points. And uh, in 2022, the star point moved to Libra and started a Libra cycle for the first time in about 250 years. And Venus has started in the sign that she rules, so therefore this makes these Venusian themes even more stronger now. And the Libra, Libra cycle shall be questioning our relationships in repeating questions, and, and this is astrologically one of the reasons there are so much of this reorganizing of our relations in many ways, uh, just not the, not the relations between our with, between humans, but relations also between companies, organizations, nations, and of course uh, star nations too. And now Venus is heading to this point where it is furthest from the Earth and shall be invisible because it shall be behind the Sun. After uh, the superior conjunction, Venus and Sun goes to to same direction, and Venus shall be visible again in the sky. Let's go forward. Now we look at this Venus cycle with this galactic astrology lenses, and we can see that this cycle is uh, noted and supported, so to speak, from outside of our solar system. And in June, 2024, Venus shall be making her superior conjunction with the Sun, and in that moment, the great attractor shall be oppo opposing this point in a very tight orb. The great attractor is the third of these uh, cosmic, farthest point of these cosmic centers in, in our known universe. And uh, the great attractor is amplifying this Venus star point into its kind of maximum. So if we think that the star point is, is our evaluation point and the, and the point that after that we should con continue with the sun together so that we show our true colors, so to speak, proudly and not hiding, now that the cosmic truth arrow is kind of pointing there, we kind of do not have nowhere to hide. The great attractor is also asking us to use our mental creativity in all our relations. And also, uh, this star point moment is one of those peak moments of the 24 where we can appreciate and understand other people's values. At the same time, we value our own and maybe understand that our communion and exchange of thoughts with each other can be loving and harmonious. Equality shall be a big theme. 
So we certainly have cosmic support for that. And um, there is also the supergalactic center connected to this in opposing Aries star point. And also the Shapley attractor is connected to this cosmic rose. So therefore also in the following years, the cosmic heartbeat is under the loving cosmic web, so to speak. And uh, the two star points that doesn't have cosmic point companion has star nations aligned. And the Capricorn point has Lyran star Sheliak, um, and the Leo point is sextiled uh, with uh, Lepus Nihal. Also in that June 4th moment is this Sun and Venus conjunction is sextiled and uh, trying to lunar nodes. And I see this early June moment very significant in collective sense because the, the Sun and Moon conjunction is in this position. And there is also this Andromeda Alfreds, which was already talked about. And then that is in, in the North Node point. And then there is this Corvus Algorab from the South Node point. So we are coming, so to speak, from the Corvus collective past and going to the Andromeda collective future. So this beautiful Sun, Venus, strong love shine is balancing our underworld, our shadow, if, if you will, and our past in very subconscious level. And we are kind of heading to our new future in a very Andromedan style, free from any limitations from the past. So uh, I think this sounds kind of a nice start for this summer. What do you think about that? I'm ready. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Tina. That that was so wonderful. And I didn't mention this at the beginning for our viewers. Definitely have your notebooks ready. <laughs> you know, taking notes. I know I'm learning so much from each of you. So thank you so much. And next, Julia, please share with us. I definitely want your notebooks for this. <laughs> Oh my God, I'm so high right now. I really hope I can keep myself grounded because my goodness, the information that um, everyone here is sharing is just brilliant and it adds more sense to my slide or the piece of the puzzle that I am bringing in as my contribution. So I decided to take a closer look at the star Algol, Beta Per Se, rather Uranus, conjunct this star starting on 25th of April, when it comes into the orb of this star, which is one and a half degrees, it'll be precisely conjunct Algol on the 7th of June. And then it'll kind of be leaving the orb on the July 14th. So quite a large window, but I wanted to look at the date when Uranus is exact conjunct Algol. So this star has quite bad reputation, but our collective of galactic astrology practitioners, as we are starting to tune into this star in our clients' charts, we are starting to uncover the blessings in disguise that come with this star when it is activated, whether through transits or certainly in our natal charts. So what I'm seeing here as I tune into everything, including the asteroids, the beautiful goddesses that are going to hold space for the major transformations that will be happening next year, I see a powerful activation of divine leadership and people who will find courage to speak up, to share things that are needed to be shared in order for the unhealthy old paradigm to truly crumble and allow positive changes to happen. So if you look at the kind of metaphoric story of Medusa, which all gold star represents, represents her head, the impact or the effect she has on those that dare to look at her is that their being crumbles. It be you become a stone, you become no longer able to continue the way you did. And also with the transits and uh, when Algol is activated through more malefic planets, like say Mars or Saturn, there tended to be 
uh, catastrophes and really difficult situations and events in the past. So I don't want to paint the pressing picture here. However, on this day when Uranus conjuncts exact Algol, it will also be opposing the goddess Pallas, which is known as the goddess of intellectual pursuit. So, and because it's in Scorpio, there may be revealing information that will cause certain heads, perhaps in leadership, to fall. Not only because of this, but it, we also have this really powerful stellium in Gemini, including Sedna will already be in Gemini here. And um, I'm so glad that Tina mentioned the beautiful Venus points alignment here. We have Sun and Venus conjunct star Regal in Orion constellation. And if you look at some of the history of star nations connected to Regal and soul records of so many people that whether I regress through hypnosis or other QHHT practitioners, there are a lot of stories connected to Orion to the movement known as the Black Leak, where there were so many souls passionately fighting for justice and for liberation of collectives that were suppressed through vicious manipulation by service to self forces, people or other nations that didn't have a planetary and collective best interests at heart. So we also have Mercury here conjunct Aldebaran, the frequency of Archangel Michael coming here strongly, and a few other powerful alignments that I'll, I'll mention briefly that I feel really are talking about a lot of information coming through, a lot of whistleblowers continuing to come up, and justice being served for any one or any organization that acted out of integrity previously. So we have this interesting grand trine between Saturn, Pallas, and Vesta. Louise talked about grand trine that was in air signs, very mental kind of energy, but this trine between these three is water trine. So a lot of emotional energy moving through. So we have Saturn in Pisces, Pallas, which as I mentioned before, is actually opposing Algol directly. Alice in Scorpio, and then we have Vesta here in Cancer, goddess of family tradition, and kind of almost like a it can turn out to be stubborn. So what I'm getting here is that perhaps the portion of humanity that, is, that feels very conservative and traditional and have certain ideas about maybe idealizing um, Pisces and Neptune also idealizing the old structures for what they hope they were, they may, you know, experience a lot of wake-up calls because this goddess Pallas, when she's in Scorpio, um, and certainly triggered by Uranus here with Algol, she tend to bring shocking news and events to make sure that higher perspective is reached, that change and transformation is happening. So I thought that's quite interesting. And another thing here, uh, Astrea, goddess of justice, will be sextiling the south node and trining the north node. So in her shadow side, with, with certain aspects, Astrea can create obsessive ideas about things that we feel are entitled to. So I feel that energy again plays into this water grand trine where there will be still many people that want to hold on to the old traditions and feeling like they are in the right. However, I feel there will be a huge amount of star seeds that are strongly connected to the Orion history, the frequency of Archangel Michael here, and also we have Ceres here, goddess that wants to bring nurturing and caring energy. And because she's in Capricorn here, she will make sure that those starseeds that are awakening will be very kind of considerate to the traditional way of thinking and kind of holding space, allowing for 
that kind of turbulent, difficult, emotional experiences for those whose worlds are going, worldviews will be crumbling. We'll have a lot of leadership that will be compassionate and nurturing and kind, patiently observing and holding space for transformation to, to occur. So these were my few cents. Oh, by the way, so this Uranus actually will be retrograding in the second half of next year. So it will actually return to this degree in April 2025. And then we have Astrea here, goddess of justice. She'll be moving until the end of this year. She'll move through signs that are connected also to justice, balance, harmony, uh, revealing secrets, um, higher court orders. You know, there is a lot of work or, or kind of projects and paperwork being submitted to high courts for organizations and leadership whether through pharmaceutical companies, whether through banking and other situations that, you know, there, there are growing groups of people that are stepping up to make sure that justice is served when people are acting out of integrity. We have Mars here, conjunct Andromeda galaxy, and Alpha Andromeda here, North Node, as Tina mentions, conjunct uh, Andromeda. So I feel that frequency also will be very strongly coming in to liberate us from things that were hidden, that were suppressing us. I, I feel very excited about the energies that are coming through. And I'm sure you all will agree that it felt like this year we were trained to withstand opposition. You know, there were, I, I know many people that felt unfairly judged or exposed to opinions that seemed maybe unreasonable and we were growing a thicker skin, I feel, in preparation for next year where more and more people will be called to stand up and speak up and um, create systems that will be able to bring greater harmony and um, eventually healthier experience for nations on Earth. Thank you for creating this space and uh, much love, strength and peace to you all. Thank you so much, Julia. Wow, that's so powerful. Joyce, please tell us about the numerology. Of <laughs> yes, it was so fun hearing all these different aspects, uh, which are all included in the theme we are going through. In numerology, the number 2024 has the frequency of the number eight. And when I cut the number eight in two, I got two circles. Like this, or like this, where you want to see it. So eight is all about the relationship between those circles. So it functions like a, a mirror. It's the mirror of truth. The truth about oneself and the circumstances one finds oneself in. So it tells us what we actively initiate on one side, we will receive it passively on the other one. So it's literally what we reap is what we sow. Now, eight is um, as a number connected to Saturn. And Saturn is the number about structure and control, responsibilities, obligations, uh, restrictions, all these kinds of things. And we heard about freedom and structures that we want to have different, uh, we want to break free, all these kinds of things we heard about. So Saturn is not always a pleasant one, but hindsight, always a constructive one. So it asks us to look at our human mechanisms regarding control, internal and external. So it's about facing our fears about not having control, about the 
unknown, as Josh said as well. And it asks us to have a sincere and honest look at our actions. What motivates them? Are we living our true desires? And it's asking us to connect our physical mind and our heart together, not letting them speak as separate entities, but as one. It's the same as a battery. We have a plus side and a minus side, and both need to be connected in order for the battery to work as a desired tool, being the human body in this case. And this exercise takes great courage. It asks us to be our own leader about leadership, not to give the responsibility away, but taking responsibility for one's own creation. So it's like the card number eight in the tarot, strength. Do you know this card? So it's facing our own limitations and fears, our own instincts of survival and the need of control based around our personal, our collective, but also our ancestral experiences. And we also heard that about a lot of energy coming in for the possibility of releasing trauma. So only by recognizing those subconscious memories because that is what we do. They are memories. They're built in and we live them every day. By looking them in the eye, by actually looking the lion in the eye, we bring them forward in the internal now. And then one can see how and in what way one's own instincts of survival is influencing their experience of life. But it is eternal, because if we have the eight sideways, we've got the infinity. So it's about staying in that middle point. Being the observer is also Aquila. Yeah, flying above it. To, to see, do we, in, in this moment, we have a choice. Because you can't, it's impossible to be physically in yesterday. And it's also impossible to be physically in tomorrow. We are only physically now. So now is the perfect moment to make a different choice. Because what I put out is what I get back. So these mirrors of reflection... That's what the eight is talking about. And we, then we also have the other side of the eight, or maybe the next level side. It's the star, the number 17, because 17 adds up as eight. So this is what we talked about as well, the stars. And eight asks us to stand between the mirror mirrors to see in the reflections the truth about ourselves. And here at the star, we are asked to realize that mirrors also have a back, not only a front side, but also a back side. So in order to have a complete view, we need to rise above the mirrors. And the star is actually the stage between the scare, uh, square of the material physical realm and the circle the spiritual realm. And the star sees of seeing this bigger picture, the higher structure and the way we are part of it. And stars are about wishes, hopes, guidance, and even in a way they can be seen as other lives and experiences. But when we take 17 apart, it also gives certain kind of information because 17 is one and seven and these eight pointed stars all the stars here are eight pointed we also have them here 
on the head of the charity. And seven is the mystical number connected to the planet Neptune. And it refers to the collective consciousness, to unity, to spirituality. And simultaneously, it also refers to everything that is fake. In Dutch, we call it Nep, Neptune. So it also entails illusions and chaos and um, deception and confusion and feeling of the truth. So how are we going to distinguish between the two? And that is the play of the mirror again. But there's one thing you can be sure about. And what you can be sure about is that you know that you exist. And that's the magician being the transmuter of the energies, also infinite. So this is also as above, so below, as within, so without. So this stage of the eight refers to the realization of body, mind and soul as a unity on a personal level, experiencing the totality in unity with the cosmos, connecting to our true essences, the infinite one, and realizing that the one is the all and simultaneously all are the one. So in review of all of this, compassion, the word compassion comes to mind. Compassion with oneself. Leave the judgments out. We are so harsh in judging ourselves. Open your heart. Be honest with yourself. Be sincere in your words. Yes, in sickness was also in the beak of the swan. What you speak out is what I get back. And of course, apply the same to any other expression of life, which is there for you as an expression in your creation, functioning as a mirror. As in the musical scale, Lyra, which also starts with Do, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do, it ends with Do as well. So it all starts with you and ends with you. So that's my 10 cents. Thank you so much, Joyce, for that very unifying wisdom download perspective. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, so for my part in sharing, I was considering this question of, is this the age of Aquarius? And I was using my left brain to answer it. And this is a question I've been with all of 2023, definitely, even earlier than that, but was really coming forward now at the end of the year. And so I was looking, I was checking all over the world, what is the rising star on the day of the March equinox? What constellations will literally be rising on that March equinox? thinking about that as the technical age of Aquarius. And what I found in my research was that it was a different star everywhere on Earth, depending on the location. And I was trying all different parallels, latitudes, longitudes, all of that. And I got in Hawaii, for example, the star rising will be Royal Star Fomalhaut, which I loved. I got really excited about that. Wow, that you know, frequential dose on the equinox. But looking at other locations in the world, I was finding stars in Capricorn constellation would be rising, stars in Pegasus constellation. It was just different depending on where I look. And so, and even Lyra constellation was in the mix, some of the Lyra stars. So I understood that I had hit this wall in my left brain and it was time to go into my right brain and investigate through a Reiki journey. So I took numerous Reiki journeys kind of with this question in the background. And 
so much information was very willing to come through. And so I will share about a particular Reiki journey I took to the 11th and 12th heavens of consciousness. And in this journey, Isis was present. She had been coming in all of December. Maybe some of you may have been feeling the presence of Isis and like the serious star energies. She was really coming in a lot in December 2023. So Isis took me to this beautiful palace in Sirius Star System. It's gorgeous, glowing, crystalline, diamond, white light, and absolutely exquisite. And there was this long, narrow pier jutting out, overlooking the water, like a giant cliff, where at the very edge you could see the water was hundreds of feet below, many meters below. And I was, I kind of looked back at her like, are we doing this? <laughs> and I was, I was fully prepared to take that leap of faith. And so I was preparing myself to make my, my most beautiful swan dive into the waters below, jumping and leaping off the cliff. And so this is what I started doing, like, you know, jump leaping in the swan formation, which is so funny that the, the Cygnus, the swan is coming through with the Pluto entering. Of course, I didn't even know that. And so I make my swan dive and I don't dive. I don't fall. I don't descend. There's no drop. There's no gravity. I fly and I soar and I know how to fly. And I'm just completely free and liberated and flying. And there are these beautiful treetops, too, that seem to appear out of nowhere. And I can go and I can have a rest on the tree. And to my utter delight, there are others having a rest on the treetops and we're talking about it and we're connecting and we're we're there together and then we're also flying together and resting on the treetops together and to me this was just such a beautiful experience to have by going within that you know we really do have this this flying, this air support. I mean, it came through in so many of the transmissions here, the galactic grand air trine, the Jupiter and Uranus coming together, inviting in this heaven on earth energies, all of the birds that are so activated, the constellations of the birds. I mean, even the Libra South Node and, and many of the transits that you know, will be occurring next year and into 2025 that we know how to fly. And to really understand that if you are activated, you will fly. <laughs> you know, there's nothing to be afraid of, you know, in, that comes along in the future. You know how to fly. Others know how to fly. Groups of others who are flying together, supporting those who are being activated in their ability to fly as well. So... Remember, you can fly, you can soar together, and we really, we are remembering this ability to fly too, that is coming from our deepest soul and spirit selves. So there is this energy and the support of rising above, of liberation that I think really pulses through so strongly next year, no matter what is occurring, whether that's a more conscious path of you know, spiritual commitment and liberation that was more intentional, intentionally curated, or whether it's one that, you know, there are kind of surprise kundalini awakenings occurring and, you know, massive connecting of the dots and new revelations occurring, that no matter what stage you are in your activation, I, I really feel that this group gathered together live and then those who are watching and resonating, like we will be called to fly, to fly together and to support those who are just awakening to their remembrance that they too know how to fly and can fly. So that's what came through. And that's what I was guided to share in this particular gathering. 
Yes. So I would just like to invite anyone with any final words before we close or open the circle. I also wanted to mention that everybody's links to connect will be in the description below. So feel free to connect with any and all of the beautiful souls gathered here today, websites, YouTube channels, social medias, all of that will be provided in the description below. So just want to open the floor to anybody who has any final words or messages, burning desires to share at this time. Hey, you all been quiet, just taking that moment together. So beautiful. Well, thank you all for being a part of this Galactic Council of Light. And we'll just take this moment now to open the circle. So I invite you to close your eyes and bring your hands together at heart center and even place your hands on your heart. I just invite you to say thank you to you. Thank you for being here today, being open to your soul growth, your liberation, your healing, your empowerment, being a clear channel for this higher guidance and higher wisdom, the higher frequencies of energies that each of us is created and designed to be able to channel through and flow through. What a beautiful gift each of you are. And so we say thank you to each other for our circle, certainly divinely ordered. So grateful for this soul family of unconditional love and light force energy gathered together across the globe, across the solar system, across the Milky Way galaxy and far, far beyond. We are so very grateful for all of our support in all of its forms. And we welcome in and invite in the highest possible expression and receive the highest possible expression, the healed timeline, the highest, most evolved, most loving, beautiful timeline possible for Earth humans in 2024. Aho, amen, namaste, and so it is, mahalo. Thank you all so much.